Okay, we are recording. Cool. So, um, hello world. Hello world indeed. Okay, so basically this is just a, a very simple interview just to, you know, for Festeris this thing. Because you do engineers.sg, which I consider to be extremely important in Singapore. Uh, but anyway, I, I looked through your CV and um, you didn't write in any of this, the stuff about civil society, which you, you were previously involved with as well, right? Like, let's say, um, Post Museum and the Sync Centre. Uh, what, what was your relationship with, let's say, Post Museum? Uh, I, I, knew the, I knew the guy was running... I met the guy who was running the restaurant next to it, food number three. Yeah. I can't remember his name. Uh, what, what's his name again? Yeah, so I met him and um, I, find, I found the idea of, of the restaurant quite interesting. I think I can't remember where I met him, probably one of the hackerspace events or somewhere. And um, I found it quite interesting and then uh, I got to know him and his, his, his friend, girlfriend or something at the time. Um, oh, what's his name? Tian or something? Oh, okay, Wen Tianwei and yeah, Jennifer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jennifer, yeah, yeah. I think married, I don't know. Yeah, they are now. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, so he was running a restaurant and then um, at, at the time I was also um, doing a podcast uh, for food blogging, food blogging and food in general. So I got... Um, I asked Tian whether I could um, um, record and just capture his uh, restaurant for just for for the podcast. I suppose she agreed, so we went and uh, did a podcast of the, of the of the place, and then he showed me the museum. I found it was quite interesting place. Quite quite uh, um, is in a very interesting neighborhood as well. Mm. So. Mm. You were saying there was a bit of an interesting neighborhood. Yeah, it's uh, it's Rowell Road, right next to. It's just right next to this Desca Road, which is a interesting place. It has a bad kind of bad rep reputation as well. So it's just right next to it, and um, it's interesting that we have a museum there in in the middle of of this um, rowdy neighborhood. But it's it. it the top subject matter that it presents is very, very modern, and it also acts as a event space for for some some events, and also quite supportive of local artists and stuff, which I find is quite interesting. And then he had a restaurant next to it <laughs> called Food Number no. Three, uh, apparently named after it's like there's apparently two other art installations or artworks around the world called Food Number no. One, Food Number no. Two, and then. Restaurant was his expression of food number three. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a vegetarian restaurant, so they serve um, handmade food, uh, whole foods that they make uh, vegetables, uh, west, it's like fusion kind of food. Kind of How nice. did you find out about him? I don't know. I really can't remember how I found out about it. <laughs> probably I met, I met, met, probably met them somewhere. And you know, somehow other oh interesting restaurant oh I'm doing a podcast on food let's go cover that place and yeah so I interview uh, him and my food I'm a food blogger that was kind of like um, anchoring the show and she basically kind of interviewed and try out the foods there I've been there once once or twice after that just to try out the spaghetti and stuff and okay in the previously they they had like traveling. Um, cooks that will uh, cooks that will be in town, and they'll have uh, guest chefs who will basically prepare food, which is kind of nice. Yeah, mm. I, I feel to attend any of them though, but it's, it seems like an interesting idea. Okay. And it's like, quite just unfortunate that I didn't carry on, but I find it's uh, I think one of the best. Uh, I think for the budget and for the for, for the budget, I think it's one of the best uh, vegetarian fusion restaurants in that part of town. Mm. Yeah.
and especially ones about atas. <laughs> it's kind of nice, uh, I think. Yeah. When, when did you start your food blog? Uh, it was a podcast. Uh, that was in 2008. Uh, it was a podcast network called Podfire. P-O-D-F-I-R-E. In Chinese, it's a poker war. Yeah. So, it was at a time where uh, I had a lot of blogger friends, and then we felt that uh, I felt that um, there was also the time where there were a lot of podcasts, video podcasts that were quite hot in, in the states, and things like think tech, like most tech podcasts that I listened to, like This Week in Tech, uh, Grumpy Geeks, and a few others, and uh, Geek Brief TV, which is another one, which is kind of nice. So basically, from there I felt, hey, you know, we in Singapore, we could also prepare something similar. There was a network in the States called Revision Tree, which is kind of like the same concept where they curate contents, video podcasts, and the company itself will handle the distribution, they have the infrastructure for recording, so basically the company provides the infrastructure and that becomes like, and that and then they let creators, content or content creators, join the network and create content using their infrastructure and the network and their marketing and all that stuff. So the content creator just focused on creating content, which I felt was uh, I I mean at the same at the time there were a lot of bloggers. I felt that there were a lot of interesting content they could come up with, right? Um, I also want a way that could they they, they always be blogging and use that's only in the uh, text in, in text and online. And I felt like they could express the, 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 another dimension to that as well, not just in text, but also in, in voice and in video. In my particular case, I felt video, voice was overrated. <laughs> oh. um, I felt we should take the next leap and do a video version of the blogger's voice. Right? Just the blogger has a voice, they, they, and we want to bring that out into the video dimension and to let people see them, see the content in real life. Um, and I did a network was cut the podcast profile network was kinda of like a way of expressing that and building on building on my network of blogger friends. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so we, I did a couple of shows. Uh, one was called um, Small Girl Big Appetite, which is the food blog, food podcast. I actually did two food podcasts. Um, I had a fell off all out with the first blogger, so that one thing was cancelled, and, uh, and this is the second one. Um, and I did a tech podcast, um, and I even tried to do one for startups. Uh, it was called e conversations. You can still find the videos on YouTube somewhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the food podcast uh, was called Small Go Big Appetite, and uh, yeah, there, there was a show where I used to cover different food establishments around town. Do you know it's you and someone else? Um, I mean, the content creators are different people. Uh, it's for managing the network and create how many of all the infrastructure and the money to buy the cameras and all that stuff. Uh, there was partially me and the company I was working for at the time. So the company I was working for had all this equipment already, so I just took them and kind of... But it's called Small Girl. Small Girl, Big Appetite. Big um, it's the girl. Yeah, that's cheap. SGB, BT, yeah. no, right. yeah. SGBA.TV, yeah. So it's just kind of interesting. Yeah. It's not a girl, so who's the girl? She has requested not to, not to review her name, so. <laughs> oh, okay. um, um, the host of the show was a lady called Maria. Yeah, she was actually our PA at the time, so. <laughs> Um, but that's not her real name, right? Huh? Is that her real name? Uh, yeah, that's her real name. Oh, okay. So, she's a nice, small, petite girl, so, yeah. Was, so that's why I was a small girl, you know, type. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and there was also other uh, shows that I did. Um, and there was someone with a dog therapist. She basically massage dogs for a living. And we did a show called It's a Dog's Life. Mm. And it was focused on pet, pet, pet friendly establishments and also doggy, doggy 
care tips and stuff. This was another area which I felt was interesting. So I wanted to, in, in the port, portfolio podcast, I tried to move away from tech. Tech was just a foundation, and I think we should move, we want to move away from just tech focused uh, pod, podcasts and content, um, which was also the trend happening in the States where. Um, at the time, 2008-2009, there were a lot of video podcasts that were for tech-specific. Tech and increasingly, you see more, more podcasts coming up which are not tech-related. They are more like beauty care and stuff like that. And which nowadays, you can find them all on YouTube. You know, all these YouTube channels So basically, yeah, you know, the, um, YouTube kind of encouraged the kind of content creator economy where the content creator has his own stuff. I think in the past it was kind of like the knowledge is siloed in just a few people, people who have gone to film school or, or you know, uh, but with the com consumerization of technology, you know, the consumerization of technology as in equipment which used to be very high end, very expensive, has now become more cheaper. Like HD cameras, hard drive, hard, hard drive HD cameras, became more affordable the last decade or so, which is made even more compact in size, so it was very, very, very useful. Uh, we had a Sony Handycam, um, the hard drive, and as an audio input, so I was, able, I was carrying around a Zoom, which has a, lot, a microphone input, and it was like audio jack right into jacked in, so it was able to get really good sound and stuff. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I knew that people, the content creators knew about their content, they're bloggers, they're lifestyle bloggers or they're tech bloggers, but they may not know about how to produce the content or the, the technical bits of producing it. So Portfire was kind of like a way of helping them cross that bridge, uh, overcome the hurdle of, you know, they have content and we have technology, we have the expertise and we help them do this. Um, yeah, it was fun times, 2008-2009 was kind of fun. Uh, it was then that I got to know about Post Museum and I was able to help them. I mean, I was able to just well, just feature the restaurant. I think I was, I can't remember whether I to shoot the video of the museum. I may not have, I may or may not have. It's probably at home somewhere in one of my archives. Unfortunately, the episode was never released, <laughs> so it was kind of sad. So I still had raw footage somewhere at home. Yeah. So Think Center, that was during my university days. This was in 2000, 2001. Uh, at the time, I was involved with a another NGO, another NGO. It was a political NGO called Socratic Circle. Socratic Circle came from the 90s. They were a bunch of political science students who like to, who want to have a, have a discussion, have discussions about political matters of the day. And in the 90s, it was they were told that you know if you want to continue discussing this outside of school, I mean outside of uh, um, the university life, they have a registered society, which they did. So a bunch of them from Register Society called the Socratic Circle and they were in the 90s when they started and they got some press about the whole process of going through the, um, this in the 90s and At the time they were still students? At the time they were still students and I think it was probably after, they started the society after they, they graduated I think they wanted to continue to meet and discuss political matters um, and this, this and the logo of the of Socratic Circle is actually a coffee a coffee cup. It's like a you know, like hot java, are you drinking coffee and talking about doing kopi and talk politics kind of thing. Um, and I joined them in 2000 uh, because of another friend of mine was, uh, was involved there and he told me about this is an interesting thing. At the time I was I was already I was major I was studying at NUS, I majored in political science and history, so I thought this was something that was quite interesting and I wanted to try and get more involved in politics outside of the classroom. Uh, it was then that I got to know the people in Socratic Circle and there was this fella who was visiting uh, a 
Sir Greg Sugo at the time, his name was called James Gomez. Uh, apparently back in the day when he was in university, he was quite a, a rabble rouser. <laughs> yeah, he basically, con he did some, there was some sh stuff that happened when he was in university, he ran for new super president and he, I think he won or something, I can't remember. Yeah, it was quite controversial fellow. This is around, this, why this is a hub. This is around the same time where other NGOs were also starting to form, uh, or rather have formed. A Socratic Circle was one, the Round Table was another one, the Round Table which has quite a few people who are now in politics. Um, and James Gomez eventually went on to start Think Center. Uh, so I met James in one of the Socratic Circle meetings and uh, I found this guy to be quite intriguing. And, um, told me about what he was doing, he was writing a book called uh, Self-Censorship, Singapore's Shame. Um, he was quite interested in taking, and he was exploring this thing called new media, just, you know, web and video and all that stuff. And it was at the same time that I was also, because I was in university, before that I was also starting to get into the IT, I was getting into IT, I was playing around computers, I built my own website, so new media was kind of like something not that new to me. <laughs> um, so James was want to, wanted to try and see what how, how we could uh, bring politics to the new age, as in bring uh, new media uh, into the into the mix. Uh, and Think Center was kind of like his way of trying to push that boundary. When I was at university, I also joined a group called the, the, the Democratic Socialist Club, which is kind of like the pro opposition. Uh, uh, grouping in at the university at the time. So we have in 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 NUS we had the political association, which was kind of like pro-establishment, and then the Democratic Socialist Club was kind of like pro-opposition kind of thing. So whatever they get Lee Sien Long for uh, uh, PA gets uh, Lee Sien Long for the for their talks will get Cham Si Tong or Lee Sun Chi Sun Juan and stuff like that. So it's kind of like we go the other way. So the guys there was kind of like. Pretty interesting as well, and so they were all my all my uh, schoolmates, and they were telling me that they wanted to try something interesting. Um, at the time, this is 2000, 2001, uh, 99, 2000, 2001. So at the time, there was a thing, a movement called Singapore Twenty One. Singapore Twenty One was kind of like a way for that the establishment tries to think about what would be Singapore like in the future. Right, I mean, going into the twenty first century, because it's a millennium. Uh, you know, millennium was coming. Uh, millennium was coming up. Y two K was coming up. There were a lot of thinking about what Singapore would be like in the future, how we should shape our society. Uh, so, Singapore twenty one. The people who were involved in Singapore twenty one uh, were, were people in the civil society and academics and students and people from pro establishment groups and stuff. Um, and they were thinking about. All these dimensions, like economic dimension, you know, uh, social, uh, sociological dimensions of Singapore 21, and there were, we felt there was a gap. There wasn't, a, the, the politics wasn't addressed. How will politics 21 be like? Um, that wasn't, that was kind of addressed in more like a volunteerism kind of dimension, more sociological kind of dimension. Uh, civil society was kind of briefly touched on, but not much into the politics. So the, the group I was in, uh, Socratic Circle, and James was involved in the Center, we wanted to, and then my friends were in the Democratic Socialist Club, they kind of like say, hey, we should try and do something to address that gap. Um, so we created this thing called Politics 21. Politics 21 was like a, a series of workshops workshops and lectures where, or other panel discussions where we bring in pol political figures uh, like Chi Sun Juan, uh, Kiang uh, to discuss about what they feel because they were kind of like the political, opposition political leaders at the time which we felt that they, they are, their views matter and their view about how Singapore should be shaped matters. So we, we, we created politics that I want to try and address the gap. Uh, Sugar Exeter was a co-organizer Think Center was was also a co-organizer. Um, Democratic Socialist Club wasn't involved directly, was but we had members who were involved uh, in 
uh, members who were in either Superac Circle or the wider group of student student groups that were involved in that. So we came together and organized uh, Politics 21. It was kind of interesting because it was our maiden trip organizing a political discussion forum. Um, so we thought we could just naively have a registration form. You know, back in that, back in, this is in 99, 1999. So we naively think that, hey, you could just have a registration form or, then, like, or even online registration form. So that was like, kind of like, politics was kind of like my first entry into the, the, that, that space between politics and technology. So he, politics only one did a website for it. It was like online registration with online forms and and there was a web page that talks about what the whole thing was about. It was just, mind you, this is in how did anyone you build web pages back then? So this is kind of like pretty avant garde, you can say. Um, yeah, so we did the we did the first talk. It was kind of nice, you know, with a lot of vibrant discussions. Um, and we were called up by by the police because we organized it without an entertainment license. And three of us, the organizers, co-organizers, like, uh, we're not sure we did anything wrong. <laughs> uh, we didn't know. <laughs> so we, we kind of told the guys, look, we didn't know that we had to actually apply for a license. And although we already, we already applied for another two more talks uh, after that. So the subsequent ones, we actually applied for the entertainment license. Uh, we, we, it was approved and we kept it to, to it. Only those registered could get in kind of list. Um, we, were given, we were let off in the morning by, by the police. It was, it was kind of fun. There was like three of us, uh, the co-organizers sitting in the room. Um, uh, or rather, yeah, we were at the police station, three of us, like James, me, and one of the other organizers. It's like, interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, and we were given off, uh, let off in the morning, so it was kind of okay. You know, it wasn't anything bad. Um, I think the time the authorities were also trying to learn how to engage with uh, groups like us. They have never had this kind of experience before. Um, they have, they're so used to rowdy and you know um, rebel rouser kind of kind of uh, opposition politicians. So here, here a bunch of us were non non aligned. We are not aligned with, with any opposition party or the PAP. We were neutral. We're, we're NGO, and we felt that we did nothing wrong. And it was the first time that they were kind of like engaging a group like us, who were civilized people, who knew what we were thinking, um, and knew what we were doing, sort of. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it was okay, you know, it, it, it seemed harmless, uh, sort of. Um, yeah, I was then, and from there, I also helped, eventually, uh, I also helped James. James Gomez was building up the Think Center website, um, uh, which I, for me was kind of like my first website ever built for um, for kind of at that scale, right? That I make website like this. So for me, it was kind of like I wanted I wanted technology to be a leveler, to level the playing field between different people, right? We didn't want the PAP to to be the only guys who had all the funds and have all the fun online, right? Um, so we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to level the playing field and we felt technology was a good way to, for, to level that playing field between the haves and have-nots, as in the establishment having all the, all the, all the establishment infrastructure, like the government websites, ministry websites, but the opposition doesn't have any. NGOs doesn't have any of that. So I felt for me, doing that as a pro bono exercise was a way of helping civil society and helping um, uh, politics in Singapore in general to kind of like raise, level the playing field. Because online, I think everyone's the same. They treat it the same. Um, yeah. It's like they say, right? Online, nobody knows you're a dog. Yeah. So from there, I went on to also did something silly um, because um, at the time I was when I was still in NUS. Um, what uh, year were you in at this time? I matriculated in 98, 98, 99. 
uh, and left NUS in 2001, mm -hmm. 2002. So, what uh, year were you in when you did uh, politics 21? I think it was in year two. It might be, but it might be in year two. So that year we had also did, I think it was 1999 or 2000, I can't remember, it was 99, I think it was 1999. That year that we, we basically, um, so, uh, so I said I joined the Democratic Socialist Club and uh, I, I, I got quite, we, all, we started organizing stuff, right, Democratic Socialist Club. I'm kind of really proud that we did something really interesting. Uh, so the year that I was organizing secretary, I think it was in '99 or 2000. Um, when I was organizing secretary, we, we decided we wanted to do something like Speaker's Corner. And mind you, that was the year where Speaker's Corner first started in Hong Kong Park, right? We already restarted in Hong Kong Park. <coughs> so that year that we started in Hong Kong Park, we also wanted to do something um, in, in NUS as well. So we did a, we did also did a Speaker's Corner at the forum, <laughs> and US has uh, and US Arts, there's like a big student gathering area, it's called a forum. So outside is a park. Right? Yeah, it's uh, where the, where the co-op is, and outside the co-op is a park. So we actually did a forum, we did a speaker's corner kind of thing uh, over there. It was under the Democratic Socialist Club. And I'm really proud that we did, we did that maybe a week or two before the actual thing in Hong Lim Park. So, yeah, it was kind of fun, um, and I actually got a spoke. I spoke at the at the, at the place, and uh, I was actually asked question by my lecturer, which is kind of scary. <laughs> um, yeah. What so, did you talk about? Um, I honestly can't remember, but I did remember the pol the question that was asked. It was something about how do you choose between opposition, I mean politics, where you elect a person, who, who should you actually choose for, you know? In, he was, in the Singapore context, my reply to the answer was, you choose a lesser of two evils, right? Either that we know or that we don't, so, yeah. I was young. <laughs> um, yeah, so through that, through, through my, um, to being part of Democratic, Democratic Socialist Club, I actually got involved. I had to talk to the Student Liaison Office quite a lot. Um, and eventually they nominated me to attend something organized by NYC. So I talked about Singapore 21 was happening. Uh, then we did Politics 21. And uh, NYC, the National Youth Council, was actually trying to put together something from the youth perspective. How young people view about Singapore 21. And so we, we kind of like, Join, so they nominated me to join in one of the groups uh, to attend the Youth 21 kind of thing. I can't remember what it's called, it was like a youth, youth forum where they talk about, where they, young people were talking about how they view about politics, uh, no, not politics, sorry, how they view about Singapore 21, the future ahead, and all that stuff. So eventually, we, it, it was from, from a big group, we narrowed it down to a smaller group which uh, was responsible for putting together the, the proposal because kind of like there was a big group with a few hundred people and there was a smaller group who was supposed to put together a presentation we were supposed to present our findings uh, our proposals to the establishment okay. uh, it was at that forum that uh, I met a bunch of people who were very interesting and one of the key recommendations at the time this is 99-2000 one of the really key recommendations at the time was to, that we needed a Ministry of Youth. Um, because of aging population, we feel that uh, young people need to be recognized, uh, their, their votes and their voices need to be recognized more. So we made that proposal. Of course, they, the establishment didn't do anything about it. Um, but of course, many, many years later, they, they formed Ministry of Community, Youth and Sports, MCYS. So, we view that, I kind of like, I personally view that as like validation of what we saw, the trends going ahead in 99, 2000. Um, but in that group, I met somebody who was actually involved with the PAP. He was a, he was a branch secretary in one of the PAP uh, constituencies. 
So at the time I was a political science student, I kind of like debated with him about politics, uh, political theory, public policy making, all that stuff. He, he told me something interesting, so look, what you look, lo- what you learn, what you know, that's all in the books, that's all in the head, right? But back down in the, um, down in the streets, down in where the people are, that's the bread and butter issues are the, are the real uh, things that people are concerned with. So I thought, really? Okay, let's show me. Show me what, it, what this is. So he brought me down to, the time was Aljunit, Aljunit uh, GRC, one of, the, one, of, one of the branches there. It was called, uh, yeah, it was Aljunit GRC. Aljunit Constituency, and yeah, I got, I kind of like sat in for one of the meet people session, kind of like see what's going on. Because I was a student, right, so I was like, you know, what's this all about? I found that it was an interesting exercise. It was a, I mean, the people session was kind of like a way that the people voice their concerns to the MP directly, right? So they kind of like come and meet the MP. That's why it's called meet the meet the people. It's interesting that you they see it from the MP meeting the people rather than the people meeting the MP. So it's kind of like. So the Meet the People session was interesting in a sense, it gave me a glimpse of what society was like at the time, and people who were struggling with basic necessities, and people who were trying to, uh, single parents who were trying to keep their marital homes, uh, public utilities, people can't afford to pay their public utilities, asking for uh, uh, installment plans, stuff like that. Things that, as a political science student, I could never have fathomed unless I've gone down to the ground to see people and meet people and hear all of their problems. And you realize that from the time you realize that what you learn in the books, um, people on the streets, people who are struggling with things, right, uh, with financial difficulty and stuff, that's not what they're concerned with. They're concerned with bread and butter issues. How do they make the next meal? I'll make the next installment payment. Um, so from there, I kind of that kind of like woke, woke me up to the idea that you know maybe the PAP is also trying to do their best. It's not just it's not like what I originally felt that you know the PAP probably had it all very easy since they're pro-establishment and stuff. Even they themselves find it difficult dealing with the ministry sometimes. You know they may write letters and stuff, but then the ministry will say no. So you realize that there is actually really, there's a line. There's a line that's drawn in the sand that says, look, this is government, this is the the party. These are two separate issues here. Two groups of people, shared interests, but two groups of people with with diverging, they have shared interests, but they have diverging ways of doing it. And um, at the same time, there was a divergent interest what they want to keep and protect. Um, and even the PAP MPs themselves uh, were very clear about the line. I, I was told very interesting stories about how um, the Ministry of National Development at the time, it was Ma Bao Tan, he would be <laughs> at the MPS, Meet the People Session, writing letters to the Ministry of, De- of National Development, which is himself. <laughs> um, which is very interesting. I mean, I, he could have addressed it immediately, but he wants. To, he he felt there was a need to make it official, and there was, of course, like the quorum in that sense. They're very. That's, they also show us how clean they are, in terms of how clean cut they they want to make it. That like, look, when I'm sitting here at the MPS, I'm your MP. I want to help you with your interests. I want to help you with your problems. Um, but when he's sitting, when he's outside the door, he's, he's a minister, minister of National Development. He has his own other things to deal with. And he needs to have their due processes, their policies that he has written, and the things that he has to follow, rules he has to follow. Um, yeah, so from that experience, I got a sense of, okay, this is, you know, politics isn't just about being a rebel rouser and being in opposition all the time, but it's about helping people with real needs. Um, so from that experience, uh, meeting this guy, he kind of 
taught me about what told me about this and uh, and very brought me into the the political into the mainstream political landscape. Um, so I joined the PAP eventually. Um, became a card carrying member, <laughs> uh, and I eventually became a youth exec youth youth committee member as a young PAP branch chairman of Aljuni. So it's kind of interesting. Um, and then from there, I also deal with other things like how politics within the party works, which is kind of another whole story. But from the experience, because the, the guy was running an IT company, so I was looking for an IT, IT job at the time, so I joined his company to kind of help build websites for people. That's why I learned, my, learned, learned all my programming skills as well. Uh, eventually, the company took on the project of creating a microsite for the PAP. <laughs> so the general election 2001 microsite was actually written by me <laughs> for the PAP, the PAP microsite. I'm very proud of one achievement that we did, which, which was uh, we took the constituency map. This, this is an example of how we use technology in, 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 uh, in, in politics and in, in all this NGO kind of approach. So we took the, all the constituency maps, we scanned, and I came up with a, a vector graphic of, of the entire constituency map at the time. And did a flash animation where you can roll over and click it. This is in 2001, hardly anyone uses flash back then, so I was probably one of the first to use it, this, use it in this way. So we had a flash animation on the front page of the web microsite. So the day after nomination, we were able to see who were the Contested constituencies, who are the, who are the non, who are the where were places of walkovers, uh, you know, and stuff like that. Eventually, that also came, uh, that that form form factor also became like how we announce the results. Uh, the microsite was also instrumental in. It was kind of like in a way the first time that the PAP was using technology in that way, to kind of introduce candidates. This is two thousand one. They wanted to introduce candidates online, and they wanted to. They had a press release so they introduced candidates. They also want the website to be synchronized with the events. So they want to show um, the candidates in their profile on the website. So I actually got early access to all of the profiles of the candidates of the 2001 general election. <coughs> one interesting thing was, um, one of the candidates at the time who was introduced in 2001 was Penny, Penny Lowe. Uh, that, that, that was the year where they introduced a bunch of single women um, entering politics. So Penny Low um, and I can't remember the name of the other um, So they were so so they, we had photos of all the of all the MPs because of all the sorry photos of all the candidates, and um, we had a photo of Penny Low, two photos in fact, one with her wearing her glasses and one without the glasses. <laughs> so we were like. Where are we given to? Uh, and my boss kind of say, you know, we want to see what what happens on stage. As in, when she goes on the press release, whether she's wearing her glasses or she's not wearing her glasses. Then, like, ah, okay. So eventually, I think she appeared with her glasses, so we used the photo with glasses. <laughs> and there was one other person that was Park Eng Eng Hen, who was also introduced that year. And we had a photo in your hand from him. Everyone was looking, took their photo and facing one direction. He was the one who was facing the wrong direction. I was like, okay, what do I do now? I can't call them and say, please retake this photo, right? Can't, there's no way I can do that. So I did some Photoshop. <laughs> Took Photoshop and flipped it. <laughs> His face was relatively, relatively symmetrical, so we can't quite tell if we actually flipped the photo. <laughs> I don't think the site is live anymore, so you can't tell anyway. So it was kind of fun. <laughs> There's always a way back machine. If you can find it, I'm sure. Um, so, there was the, so that was kind of like the first website we built in PHP as well. It was kind of... I tell this story to people that, you know, I, I, I pick up PHP out of necessity because the company at the time was only running uh, Windows servers and we were using this uh, programming language called ColdFusion. So we took on the PAP website project. Um, the server was running the Linux, running Linux. It was running Apache. 
So, and it didn't have Covision, which is the language that we all knew. Um, so we had to try something different. Um, and PHP was one of, the, one of the choices available. So I took it. I learned the language. And it, was, it was so rudimentary, but it was, based, it was usable. I had a content management system that I wrote myself. <coughs> At the time, I didn't even know how to upload photos using PHP, right? So, like, like, just the file form, whatever. I didn't even know how to handle all that. So what I did was, I just had a form field that has a file name. Then I FTP the file in and give it the right name. <laughs> and yeah, it was a very simple publish, 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 right? Because we didn't know how, they were, how the candidates would be introduced. We didn't got the mess, got the news about who would be introduced that day. Because the PAP at the time was like doing press releases every two days. So we didn't know who would be releasing in which batch. So we had to, we had to come up with a system where we could just add people to a batch and release them and publish them on the website as a whole. So all the candidate data was actually entered on the website beforehand, but they were hidden from view. Until such time we knew who would be introduced, um, who were people introduced at the press conference, then we add them and publish them. So it was kind of, kind of fun going through all that. Um, so that was in 2001. So that's where I also started picking up programming and doing more web design, taking web design as a web, web development as a serious career choice. Um, eventually I left the PAP as well, um, for various reasons. Um, and in the 2000, which year was this? I think two general elections after that, 2000, maybe 2008, I can't remember which generation was it, yeah. Um, no, wait, it was before that, 2004, 2005 general election, I did, I did another political website again. This time, as I had my own company, I was running my own business at the time. I already left the PAP, but my friends were from way back in, in, in NGO days, people from Socratic Circle, my friends from Socratic Circle, my, some of my friends from um, Democratic Socialist Club, some of my friends from Think Center, basically James, um, they decided to join the Workers' Party. At the time, I, had a good, I, was, I, was, I had a close relationship with, with, a, with a guy, uh, his name is Melvin. So Melvin is actually an activist. He was from a friend I knew, I knew from Socratic Circle days. Uh, he helped with Think Center, and in that year, he actually, he actually joined the Workers' Party as an activist there. Um, and they needed help with building a microsite for the Workers' Party website. So uh, I think, I can't remember which year it was, but it was, we did the microsite for the Workers' Party. So it's kind of interesting that in 2001, I did the PAP uh, general election microsite, and the subsequent, uh, I think one or two Gs later, I did the one for for Workers' Party, it's kind of like, life has come full circle. <laughs> uh, so, a couple of questions. Uh, so who was the guy who got you into the PAP, the one you met at NYC? Uh, his name is called Gerard, Gerard Hui. He runs, he was a former banker from Credit Suisse and he, he basically started a company called tinyrate.com um, and I joined the company as a web designer. He was at the same time also branch secretary of our Junit branch um, under Dr. Dr. Tosike, who was an MP of MP in our Junit at the time. So it was through him I got to know about politics I got in, in the PAP. Um, that's how I also got involved with the young PAP because Gerard himself was actually on the, on the committee in at the time uh, the YP uh, exco exco. Um, so it was around a time as well where I also got more involved with uh, the technology people inside the PAP um, because of what, I did, what we were doing for the 2001 general election sites. At the same time, we, I was also um, a young PAP member. I was a branch chairman uh, of the Orchini branch. At the same time, we also, uh, was, I was also a technology person. So they kind of like, hey, you know, this, you seem to know IT. We need someone to help with our website, the Young PAP website. Um, why don't you help us? Okay. So I 
did some work on the Young PP website as well. Uh, I think we, in fact we may have done the Young PP website back in 2000, 2001. And we actually introduced, um, we actually, I, I was an administrator on the forum as well. So the Young PAP was maintaining an a, a online forum using PHP BB. Um, and I was actively managing and administering it. So it was me and a few others who were moderators and administrators of the site. So, yeah. So it was a bunch of us who were kind of trying to engage tentatively <laughs> the netizens, they called them at the time. So it was, it was interesting. So, and interestingly enough, uh, later in life, I actually met people who were um, at least two or three people who were active members of the forum. <laughs> I knew them by their online name. Um, people like Prodigal Son, Modius, um, which I met eventually in real life. <laughs> uh, I, I used my real name on the site, uh, Mike Cheng, M-I-C-C-H-E-N-G. So, kind of like, you, your name sounds familiar. Uh, yes. Of course, there were no photos of me at the time, but um, but after some like I met Prodigal Son quite interestingly through a uh, startup forum. He was kind of like a, one of the moderators of the forum. And I met him, and I chatted with him. The more we talk, we're like, you seem interesting. Like, your way you say things, you know, sounds really like interesting. So, I found out he was Prodigal Son. <gasps> I was like, wow, in real life. It's so cool. It's, um, yeah. So why did you, would you mind sharing why you left the PAP? Is it for some re few reasons? Um, at the time of moving from the young PAP as in young, and also the young PAP branch chairman of the time, um, there was a need for people to in the branch, they felt that there, there was a need to um, get more involved with the grassroots. Because at the time I was already helping out in the, the meet people session, I was involved in youth politics and the young PAP. Um, so much of politics is what I volunteer work. <laughs> so they felt that they needed some involvement uh, in the youth groups as well, in the, at the CC level, community centers, and grassroots organizations. So I joined the Youth Executive Committee um, as a member. Um, I got more involved in grassroots activities. Um, so it came to a point where there were where there were questions asked about where my allegiance lie, right? Which is kind of funny in the sense that I did all this work in the past with the for the Young PAP website. I was involved in youth politics at the Young PAP level. I was involved in the meeting people session and I was, I was, in, I was there for, to build things up at the branch level. Uh, they questioned my allegiance because they were... How did they come up? Well, they kind of like, hey, you know people from opposition? That, who, oh, uh, if these were my contemporaries at the time, right? Um, you might know them by name, people like Yao Xingliang, who eventually became the uh, short-lived um, MP of Hougang, taking over from Lao Dakiang. He was my contemporary. Melvin, as, as I mentioned, was, was a good friend of mine. Um, James Gomez. And there were a few other activists who were involved in, in the Workers' Party at the time. They were long-time acquaintances and friends. So somehow word got around that I knew these people, which I've already always been forthright with it about, about this. I've knew, I've told my MP at the time, Dr. Ong Se Hong, I told him about that. Dr. Tosike as well, we told him that, look, before you assign me, you appoint me as a branch, as a branch chairman, I need, you need to know something. This is the people that I knew in the past. They were my friends, they're just friends. Where I'm not involved in any of their, of their political activities um, right now. We may have been friends and doing some activities in the past, but at the time, we, it was, we were not involved in them anymore. 
So, yeah, they knew, but still, uh, there was a bit of a discussion at the branch secretary meeting many years ago where there were questions asked specifically about me. And I think my MP got a bit embarrassed that, that it was raised. Um, there were insinuations that I was recruiting on behalf of the Workers' Party, which is very serious allegations at the time. So I told my MP, look, I'm not involved in that, that's all nonsense. It's our lies, I'm not involved in any of those activities. I knew them as friends, and that's it. Um, he refused to believe me, or rather he felt that the best way was to cut me off from all these activities. Um, he basically asked for my resignation from my grassroots positions. And at the time I was the YEC chairman, youth executive committee chairman of my, of my youth group in our journey. Um, yeah, so I kind of like, resigning would be, a, would be a sign of guilt, which I refuse to do. I told him I refuse to resign, and I told people so uh, I refuse to resign. And even from then on, people that knew uh, from inside the party started keep, keeping me at the arm's length. Right? They 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 would message me saying I believe in you. You would say you don't, you're not part of the Workers Party. I believe in you. They say in private, but um, the reality was my name was already tainted with these allegations. Um, I didn't see the need to continue in, in, the, in, the, in the PAP. I didn't see the need to continue my work there. At the time, I was just running my own business. I felt that there was no need for me to go through all that trouble anymore. Right? If you don't want me to be there, I won't help you anymore. Right? So I left. Yeah. Um, yeah. So then you went on to help the WP set up the microsite. Well, that was all a commercial thing. Um, it was all purely commercial. It was a business decision to work on that site. It was, I, it's not that I believe in their politics. I sometimes feel that, well, their politics is not bad. Their politics is not bad. Like, the idea of, in, in that year that they were, they were introducing a new, the, or it was a new idea, it was they introducing, they introduced a idea of the, the new poor. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of like people who are not exactly poor but because of everything else, the cost of living is high, they get into debt so even though they're making a lot of money, they're in debt so the workers party sees that as the new poor which is an interesting idea but you know, for me it was like okay, you're, you're poor, you're poor because of your own circumstances you have no self-control, that's your problem <sighs> yeah, we can't say that publicly <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's not that I believe in their politics, but because it was a business decision, and I felt it was a challenge. Again, it was underneath all this political phase and whatnot, I still believe in technology being a leveler, to level the playing field. The PAP at the time already had their own people who were doing the website, so they're they they pretty safe on their own. Um, yeah, so when I took over, I did the, uh, basically I just did the microsite, not the main site, just the microsite. Yeah, it was simple, basic stuff. Yeah, and I hardly have any face time with the political leaders at the time. It was strongly true, one or two people. At the time, my liaison person there was Go Ming Sing. <laughs> it's quite notorious, notoriously known for other things, but you know, it was quite interesting fellow. Yeah. Um, again, it was a purely business decision, so it's like, I'm doing this website because they're paying me to do it. Mm -hmm. Not because I believe in what they do, but it's just purely a commercial decision. Mm -hmm. So then, uh, let's go on to, of course, engineers.sg. Yeah. I, I may have other questions later, okay. but let's start with that one. Okay. Okay, so, so in, in you, you, you said it before, I know, like, uh, to other people why you started it, but maybe share again where, when and why you started it? Um, and Genius SG is kind of like, a, right now it's a video site, 
it's just a playlist of all the uh, tech meetups in Singapore. Um, I'm at a time where, where there are a lot of meetups happening. I started the PHP user group in 2006. There was only a few people who were there. And um, I took some videos of the first few meetups and I felt that those videos were very good in showcasing the, the people and the ideas at the time. And there were subjects being taught or talked about which were very interesting to the tech, in the tech community. But I felt that in the last few years, um, there was an explosion, explosion of tech meetups. Um, even with this explosion of techno technology user groups, um, there were still people who were kind of, who naively think that, that no one else is doing this, no one is doing this, which is kind of ironic and shows how out of touch they are. So there was people who were asking questions like, where are the engineers, right? Where are the engineers in Singapore? So I was like, okay, um, maybe it's our fault as a community that we have not done a good work, good job in promoting what we do, uh, and we have not talk, talk, told the whole world about what we actually, what we are all about. And the technology, technology user groups basically live mostly online. The tech user groups are mostly on Facebook or meetup.com and there's hardly anything like this. In, in, when I started the PHP user group, I felt there were a few things that I felt were very important to have. One was creating building awareness. And the way to build awareness is to have an online presence and have photographs. Photographs are a very powerful way of conveying that you're not alone. When you see photos of room full of engineers, people who are like-minded people. It's a very powerful message that says, you are not alone, there's a support group here. Um, maybe it's partially because of my Christian background. I felt very, 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 early on when I entered the industry, I felt that there was isolation in terms of what me as an engineer doing my own thing, and there wasn't any support group. So as a Christian, we have the concept of cell groups, we have the concept of being in a youth youth group or something where there's, there's a large group of people who are doing the same thing, pursuing the same interests and finding support in, in that community. At the time, so I felt there was a need to also try and reproduce this spirit in the tech community. So I started the PHP user group um, and I did meetups where, where people of, of the same uh, interests could meet and talk about technology and see themselves as a, as, as a group, as a com identify themselves as a, as a community, as a group. And photographs is a way of showing people that there is, you're not alone. I mean, video also tells you that there are things you can learn from other people who, there's no, nothing that you, it's to encourage people that you just, even though you know very little, what you know can benefit somebody out there. What you think might be a very small amount of knowledge is actually it could actually be an eye opener to someone who has no no knowledge. It's an eye opener to someone who has no knowledge of what you know, and that's very empowering. So I want to try and reproduce that idea um, in a wider scale. Um, videos is a way of kind of showing it, showing that, um, and engineers SG was kind of like a, a, an extension of that as well. It's an extension of help telling the whole world about tech. the geeks in Singapore and the tech community here are just awesome and they have what they have something to say and what they are sharing are actually very good information that can be and they are, they are not just people who they have they are people who are knowledgeable, right? So Ingenious SG was like a way of capturing just the little bits of tech community. Um, and things that people say and, and what the content of what is being presented at, the, at these tech meetups uh, is a way of showcasing what people know, already know, and the knowledge can be shared so people can use these videos to level up and learn new skills. Uh, and basically, people who miss going for meetups can actually use these videos as a way of catching up. Um, I think increasingly there are also more um, tech community is growing up. 
and the tech community is getting the people in the tech community are also not they just not just consist of students and young people, but they're also family men, family women, people who have with families. And it, and evening times are actually very important for them. They to spend time with their family. Um, so these videos is kind of like a way of hey, these meetups happen at a time where you're not convenient to watch or to be there physically. So this video is a way of telling you, helping you catch up and learn those uh, things that you would you missed out. There were an initial fear that you know if we have this video, people wouldn't show up for the meetup anymore. You know, because they'll be like, ah, you know, I'd rather watch the video at night or something. But it has, to, it has not been the case. Listen, the meetups still happen. It's, the rooms are still filled with people. And the videos are still going up and it benefits a lot of people. Especially when we have... Um, the tech community in Singapore has grown and has expanded beyond just locals. Right? I think right now, I think majority of tech... Uh, of, of people in tech uh, are foreigners. They're not locals. They're like from India, from Vietnam, from Myanmar, Malaysia, even further a few like San Francisco, um, Chicago, Europe, UK, Hungary. <laughs> we have all sorts of people who are physically here and, and being part of the tech community and then um, uh, I think in a way the videos also helps reach out to more people. Um, not just so it serves a couple of purposes to show people that there are engineers in Singapore and they, they, they are actually smart people and it's also for people who want to level up and learn things and use this video to learn things and it's also a help people who are entering this industry um, to kind of get a glimpse of what other people like right people who are in this industry right now so videos kind of serve these three purposes the way I see it. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, the tech industry is growing up, tech community growing up. Uh, I, I also noticed that, uh, let's say a couple of years ago, you would hardly see anything happening in Singapore. Like there would be pockets of activity, but then I don't know what happened uh, within one year, two year, all of a sudden there seems to be an explosion of community events across the tech scene, the maker scene, mm. everywhere in fact. What do you think happened? Is, is this, is it, was there some sort of common shift? I think there were... I think Singapore became more visible. It became more visible in the world for some reasons. Well, for reasons like Eduardo Severin is physically here, <laughs> the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Facebook is physically here in Singapore, um, and the startup community has just been reaching out and finding more tech people to come here, and I think Singapore has become a safe uh, place to visit. Singapore you know, being a safe place to visit makes it easier for Europeans to come here and look around. Um, and of course, being the startup community is growing up. And the startup community also consists of a lot of tech companies who are looking for good engineers. And because of that, a lot of these engineers come to Singapore. I think on top of that, there are also a lot of tech companies uh, like Yahoo. PayPal, Facebook, Google, they have set up their regional headquarters here. Um, and even mid sized startups that like Make the Tree, now called Make Me, um, Vicky, and f so many others that have physically set up shop here, right? Um, that makes it more attractive for engineers, just uh, attractive as a place to visit, attractive as a place to come and find work. Um, because engineers are always in demand right now. And Singapore just generally being a very safe place for you to visit, um, to come and to work here. Right? And infrastructure I think helps a lot. Um, a combination of all these factors I think encourage foreign input, foreign injection of 
talent into Singapore. Um, and of course, there is somehow shortage of local talent. <laughs> and you see a lot of these startup, uh, these musical events um, are actually started by foreigners who are based here or working here. Quite a few of them. Um, I mean, it's not that the technology stack hasn't been around for uh, in the past, but it's just that it became to a point where there's a critical mass of engineers with enough interest in a topic to want to start a group. And I think also technology uh, also play a part. It's in websites like meetup.com, facebook.com, made, made it easier to get the word out. And say is that tell people that we have a group here. Like how I start, how the PHP music group kind of like skyrocketed back in 2008, um, 2009 was kind of like the technology space was just ready for it. Right? Where I started the music group in 2006, the first meetup I ever did was at Brewworks, and there were five people still having beer in the pub, so it was quite sad. And yeah. <laughs> but Fast forward two or three years later, you see more interest in the idea, and we had tools like Facebook that could help us propagate the idea. Um, I think even today, you know, meetup.com, it makes it a lot easier to. Meetup.com is more mainstream now, I feel, and more people getting on meetup.com. I started the Peach Music on meetup.com, at the time, it was hardly anyone there. Facebook was the one place to go for those kind of things, and now it's just the pendulum seems to have shifted back to meetup.com because. Um, Facebook has done something to the Facebook uh, events page that kind of makes it impossible to reach your audience. So, Meetup.com is kind of like a place to be. And there are also more tech conferences happening in Singapore. The um, JSCon was actually quite instrumental in bringing a lot of people into Singapore. Um, Radar Ruby Conference, the Py PyCon. These are technology conferences that are happening here. And in the past, when we talk about tech conferences, we think about enterprise grade, you know, government led conglomerates doing stuff. But increasingly, you see tech conferences run by locals, the grassroots, right? So, which is way more inclusive um, and, and covers the whole spectrum of, uh, it covers the whole spectrum of. Enterprise, all the way to startup tech, startups who will find something to talk about there. Also, another thing that was that is really instrumental is there are more companies who are opening up their space. Back in 2008, Microsoft had a very beautiful office where big conference rooms and stuff, and they opened up to the open source community like ours to hold our events. Nowadays, there are even more of such things because uh, partially because I think, as I said, tech, the people in tech are growing up. Students that used to be used, students that used to um, attend these meetups are now in position where they can influence decision makers <laughs> to support these these startup groups or the open source groups and tech groups. Um, one example would be Lawrence Butra. Lawrence was uh, uh, he, when he was in NUS, he joined a company called Chalkboard. He actually built quite a few really interesting stuff for them at Chalkboard. He did a, when he graduated, he joined um, Homey.co, uh, Darius Chung's uh, little startup. Uh, and now he's working at PayPal. So from very early days when he was in NUS, he was already active in, in the tech community. He, just, he created a couple of uh, um, stuff there. Uh, one was called start Startup Roots to help students in NUS uh, and in universities uh, get jobs at startups and to learn about startup life in Singapore. And he also became part of Geek Camp. And now he is a, an engineer at PayPal. And PayPal once now he is kind of like spearheading initiatives to support the community. Right, like say opening up the space at PayPal for tech meetups to happen there, even helping to channel marketing funds to, to be uh, to, for events like Geek Camp uh, and other conferences happening in town. Um, is, is that why they're also um, getting Chen Jie to get a set of? Yeah, 
somewhat like that. I think it's part of the documentation. Yeah. So it's this. Um, so this combination. So there are a combination of more foreigners here. Uh, more startup community is growing up. Startup community has successes. Tech tech companies uh, from around the world has the headquarters here, and they have an active evangelism team who will actually approach and work with the local tech community. More conferences that are happening here now. Tech conferences, um, which brings which attracts and bring people here, and. In fact, there are people who I know of who came for like JSConf like two three years ago. They were they were able to find jobs um, just meeting people here, which is very interesting. Um, and then the tech tech companies are also opening up to uh, because of their their active evangelism team. They also they also want to involve. They also want to provide um, meet up space. Uh, most recently, Amazon just restarted their kind of Amazon user group, and we saw that they were with awesome space and they opened it up to other tech communities. Like last last week alone, there were three meetups happening at Amazon's office, uh, and this week we had two meetups happening at PayPal's office. Um, there are other spaces like ThoughtWorks have opened their space for uh, for Rails girls. Uh, Microsoft has always had their space open for tech communities to, to have meetups there as well. Um, I think the proliferation of available free spaces, especially hackerspace as well. Hackerspace is one of the first spaces to actually be free, freely available for anyone in the community to organize meetups and, and use that space. I think it's a, car, it's a nice focal point as well. Hackerspace is a good focal point for a lot of these people to meet, talk, get involved. I guess also there are more interests. There's more interest and there's critical mass of people interested in the topics to start tech meetups. Like in the past we didn't have, we, 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 we have had JavaScript for years. It took I, but the JavaScript meetup only started like two, three years ago. Which is interesting. But it's it came it came out of a Again, this is where the foreign talents make, make a lot of difference. They come here, they want to get to know the local community more uh, because they're now working here or they're physically, want, they want to contribute. And the way, way they can contribute is to start in meetups. Um, and that's a, that's a way for them to meet people, get to know people, potential hires, find potential uh, employers. Um, some cases will meet their, their future wives and, <laughs> and boyfriends and girlfriends. So it's um, it's interesting, you know, um, uh, the whole the whole this combination of many factors that kind of made it made it more made the scene more vibrant and more tech meetups happening at the same time. So it's, yeah, there is a dual. Uh, it, it's the two sides of this, right? Mm -hmm. It's great that these foreign foreigners are here, these foreign talent are here. And we have to admit that it's really in part due to them that this the space has opened up, the the scene has kind of boomed, not just in tech but also I'm seeing it in DIY bio, I'm seeing it in uh makeup the, the makeup movement as well. But at the same time, you know, you go to these events and a lot of these communities are made up of foreigners which means and I think you mentioned also that let's say if something happens in Singapore a lot of these people may have to go I see in, in sort of an economic crisis I think we're not as bad as certain countries where I know of hacker spaces in certain countries where it's made up entirely of foreigners. I think in Singapore we'll have the benefit of an educated um, group of people who are locals, and the locals are also involved in some way in our running and organizing the communities. So even if all the foreigners go away, I feel we will still have people who can start up those events or continue running those events, spreading those groups. There were groups that kind of died because the key organizer left. Like Amazon user group actually closed down for almost a year because the person who was organizing it left. 
um, it actually community comes and go, right? I think in Singapore, uh, like the Peach Music Group, before I started the Peach Music Group in 2006, there were already two um, false starts. <laughs> two other people have at least tried to start a Peach community here. It never took off. The Java Music Group has always been around. It's, it's sponsored by, I don't know whether it's still, they were sponsored by some microsystem at the time. But for a long time, it was dormant, right? It was hardly anyone using it. And now it's yeah, hardly anyone's using it. Or rather, hardly anyone knows about it. Uh, it's not active anymore. So there are groups that comes and go. Uh, I think it's just a sign of the community moving and growing and going through different phases. Um, it also shows about, I think if the people feel itchy enough um, that there's a vacuum, somewhere of a technology stack not being represented. I'm sure the community, in the community, someone would step up and try to do something. And there are also groups and, and people who are actively sparking off stuff. I think we have things like uh, Rebuilt, which, uh, and the couple behind it is Chin Mei and Sayani. They're, they're just so phenomenal in, in, in encouraging groups to, to, to start up. Like they, they were instrumental in creating this thing called the Papers We Love, which kind of like a crossroads between tech, tech and, and academia. So like, it's like they, those meetups, they'll present papers, technology papers, and it's a good way for the people in tech who are interested in computer science and other science, academic related stuff to, to basically have a quick overview of those papers. Right? Um, they also help in running this thing called hackware Hackware is kind of like a meetup where you show off some hack, some technology hack or some interesting things that they're, they're working on, the makers or the electronics in, in nature. Um, like in the last hack where uh, Roland, was talk, uh, one of, who's an active community member, was talking about um, amateur radio, which is kind of like ham radios. Hardly anyone uses that now, but he's trying to get a license for that himself which is interesting so he talked about the whole experience of it um, yeah so it's like there are people who are continuously creating new groups and thinking about ideas even trying to um, trying trying something um, I think it's a, as a community with all this foreign injection and also people local people can step up I think we we are not in shortage um, would it be a danger if all of them leave and nothing happens? Maybe. I mean, groups that were, are irrelevant will go away. Groups that are still relevant will continue to thrive. And um, it's just a normal process of how community grows. There will be technology stacks that are no longer relevant, they'll go away, and, you know, stuff like that. You never know, because it's kind of like, in, yeah. That's the nature of communities, right? It's organic. Yeah. You were uh, graduated with a uh, double degree. Here's an interesting thing. I never actually graduated. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I studied history and political science as a double major, but uh, I never actually graduated. Um, of, for convenience sake, I'll tell people I've been to NUS, which I have. I never graduated didn't have enough modular credits to graduate, so... No, I have, enough, I have enough modular credits, but my cap was too low, so... Yeah. yeah. It's foolish. I was a foolish person at the time. Did some foolish things. Failed a couple of exams, so... Yeah. Anyway, it's... Um, it was... It didn't stop me from entering IT, so... Which is, in a way, something I was really keen on doing at the time, so, yeah. And you're doing pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you say that uh, any of the stuff that you learned in, in your time in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences has uh, impacted your way of thinking of doing things today?
you get, I guess my time in, in university gave me an appreciation about politics, appreciation of how policies are made and um, how to how to manage people <laughs> in a way. Yeah, so it's all been a fun time. <laughs> I think that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you so much for this interview as well.